Okay, how is it going? Yeah, it's going well. I mean, good. Uh, well, the center is certainly thriving. Yeah. Yes, I think we are we are actually managing to make it work despite all this. I'm impressed. Yeah, and I think it's working. Let's get started with a few announcements. On uh, <laughs> Friday, we will not have any uh, lunchtime talk because there is a workshop at 3 p.m. from 3 to 5.30 organized on Jim Woodward's new book. And the two commentators are Jenna Ismail, philosopher of physics and of science more broadly from Colombia. And someone some of you might not know, Tobias Gerstenberg, who is a young, very influential psychologist coming from Stanford working on, on causal cognition. So Toby and Jenna will be commenting uh, and then uh, Jim will be responding to uh, their commentaries. So next lunchtime talk after today's talk is next week on Tuesday, Bob Batterman will be giving the lecture that we had postponed uh, last uh, week. It's at 12.10 as uh, usual, and you're invited to join us. If you want, if you're online and want to attend this lecture as usual, go to uh, the um, website center, find the calendar, and then and there you can register for any of the center's events and get a Zoom invitation. Today it's my uh, pleasure uh, to uh, introduce it, actually, for some of you to, as many of you, I suspect, to reintroduce uh, Nick uh, Rescher. Um, Nick needs no introduction, obviously, um, but it's my job, I will introduce him nonetheless. Uh, uh, you know, he's a uh, distinguished university professor of philosophy, the Department of Philosophy here at Pitt. He's a former a director of the Center for Philosophy of Science and he's a current chairman of the Center for Philosophy of, of Science. Uh, many of you, of you know some of his work. I doubt any of you know all of his work because he's published more than 100 books, uh, which is uh, uh, just incredible. And uh, 16 of which have been translated in other uh, languages. I mean, one of the aspects of uh, Nick's work that's, uh, I think, distinctive is the fact that it's extremely systematic and brings together all the areas of philosophy in exchange with one another. I think that's one of the many distinctive aspects of his work. As you know, Pete uh, created in 2010 uh, a prize, the Nicholas Fisher Prize for Contribution to Systematic Philosophy, and we've been awarding that, that prize since then to some of the leading systematic philosophers in the world. He's won many awards, been, been president of many associations, I mean, the APA, the American Catholic Philosophy Association, the American Metaphysical Society. As I said, he's won many awards. I just mentioned one for uh, the sake of time. In uh, 2016, now a few years ago, uh, he received the uh, Helmholtz Medal, Medal, which is the most distinguished academic award from uh, the Germany Academy of the German Academy of Science. Uh, so today it's my uh, pleasure to, uh, to welcome Nick again at the center. Thanks. Those kind words. Thank you. Thank you. On the uh, distance involved, uh, I am contemplating unmasking, but if you can hear me uh, through all this stuff uh, adequately, then I, I won't. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story today, a rather strange little story, uh, which I entitle A Fallen Branch from the Tree of Knowledge. Uh, what that means <laughs> will, I hope, become clear as the uh, proceedings proceed. Uh, it relates to uh, a uh, discipline or would-be discipline called futurology. In the decade from 1965 to 75, there was an explosion of activity in the predictive domain. One prominent example was the commission for the year 2000, a study group chaired by Daniel Bell 
for the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1965. Resources for the future in Washington, D.C. and the National Planning Association were also active in future-oriented inquiries. Then there was the Club of Rome's very influential investigation uh, of the social and environmental impact of industrial and technological development, which issued in a widely publicized and much criticized <laughs> limits of growth study. Not to be done, outdone in the US, the uh, Congressional uh, Research Service established the Future Research Group to provide uh, support for policy deliberations. And in the early 70s, the National Science Foundation launched its project of devising science indicators on the analogy of the economic indicators of the Commerce Bureau. And this was filled in in the 19, uh, late 1970s by the uh, extensive five-year outlook problems, opportunities, and constraints in science and technology uh, printed by the government printing office in 1980. All of these studies served the same fundamental objective, to provide guidance about the future as background for public policy formulation. This diffusion of fut futurism was bound up with the uh, ever increasing prominence in all industrialized nations of what might be called the advice establishment. Academics, working scientists, technical experts, and pundits of all sorts serving on advisory boards, policy study groups, and public commissions, developing information, ideas, and uh, other uh, resources for guidance about uh, the future of public policy formation. Enthusiasm also sprung up, not only for making concrete predictions, but also for projecting scenarios, pictures of alternative futures. Developed out of wargaming techniques, this methodology of possibility projection was initially conceived at the Rand Corporation in California in the early 1950s, and was subsequently applied extensively to issues of po uh, economics, politics, and international relations. All this was before Rand underwent the uh, major transformation from a, a military supportive organization to a public policy supportive organization, still witnessed very obscurely in the enormous Rand building opposite the cathedral, uh, not in the Cathedral of Learning, but the Catholic Cathedral here on uh, Forbes Street. Uh, now, the rise of a movement uh, and virtually an industry of futurism and futurology in the Cold War period was uh, one of the characteristic features of the day. And uh, many writers urged uh, the recognition and elaboration of a new science whose prime task was that of forecasting the nature and impact of technological innovation. This futurism soon became institutionalized in nonprofit research institutions, such as the Institute for Research in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, the Hudson Institute in Croton on Hudson, New York, as well as the Institute for the Future and the Institute of 21 Century Studies uh, that were launched at this time. In Europe, there was the Institut für Zukunftsfragen in Vienna, and the World's Future Society was launched in Washington, D.C. in 1961 with a magazine called The Futurist, first published in 1967. Soon other journals like Futures, Future Research Quarterly, Futurible, and Futurific sprang up. And in the 1970s, various doctor programs of future studies were launched in American universities and courses in the field proliferated in business schools in particular. Also notable in this connection is the con uh, contemporaneous blossoming of futurism in popular culture. The great success of Alvin Toffler's best-selling Future Shock of 1972 propagated his enthusiasm for futurists as, quote, the new soothsayers and seemingly brought this uh, prediction to verification. Most of the credit for popularizing futurology, or much of the credit, belongs to the World's Future Society, 
It sponsored the first global conference on the future in Toronto in 1980 with an attendance of over 6,000 people. Now at the forefront of this wave of futurism stood a philosopher, philosopher Olaf Helmer. Olaf was born in Berlin in June of 1910. He studied mathematics and logic at the University of Berlin in the 1930s and became a close friend and intimate with Peter Hempel there. In 1934, he took his doctorate with a dissertation on the formal axiomatization of geometry begun under the direction of Hans Reichenbach. That very year, Helmer emigrated from Nazi Germany to Berlin. I'm sorry, to Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Not a Freudian slip, but a strange slip nonetheless. Uh, that very year he emigrated to Britain. There he earned a second doctorate in philosophy under Susan Stebbing at the University of London, Bedford College in 1936. His second dissertation was on logic, specifically on the Russell paradox, and Bertrand Russell himself served as an external, external examiner. His studies in Berlin completed, Helmer migrated to the US in 1937, and along with Hempel, he worked with Carnap as a research assistant at the University of Chicago, and then taught mathematics for several years at the University of Ur uh, Illinois in Urbana and at City College in New York. During this period, Helmer supplemented his modest income as a junior academic by translating some scientific books. And in 1944 to 45, that is at the end of the war, he also worked as a collaborator with Paul Oppenheim, whom he'd first met through Hempel in early 44. He commuted regularly to Princeton from his teaching post in New York and stayed with the Oppenheims three days a week there. His work with Oppenheim ended late in the war when he became involved in mathematics-based war work for the National Defense Research Council under the direction of John Williams. In 1946, when Williams began the founding father of Rand, or one of the founding fathers of Rand Corporation in Santa Monica, Helmer also joined the enterprise, being appointed as one of the very first staff members of this think tank dedicated to keeping wartime scientific expertise in the Air, Air Force orbit. Helmer's ID card at Rand bore the number five. By the time that I myself joined uh, RAND, where I worked during the 1940-54 to 56 period, Helmer became one of the great group leaders in mathematics division. He took to Southern California like a duck to water. His relaxed informal style suited that of the institution to a T. And he lived in an attractive, typical Los Angeles suburban house on fashionable Mandeville Canyon Road. And in the 1950s, made in the late 1950s, made the investment of a lifetime by building a small stilt elevated house on the narrow strip of land on the coast road off the beach at Malibu. Personally, Helmer was an easygoing and friendly individual who always brought to his work the same naive freshness, enthusiasm, and playful spirit that de delighted uh, everyone in his company. He was also impatient of detail. The active writing up of his researches was for the most part left to his collaborators. It is somehow characteristic that the one occasion when he compelled, was compelled to provide the words and not just the ideas of the paper, namely in his 1945 paper, joint paper with Oppenheim in the Journal of Symbolic Logic, uh, yielded the most sustained piece of writing, ex of written exposition that he ever produced at one go. As matters evolved, however, Helmer's main academic contribution was in the field of futuristics. Once he became engrossed in matters of prediction and futurology, this replaced all other concerns. He never returned to the work on confirmation or evidentiation that had characterized his early interests in his connection with Hempel and Oppenheim. After more than 20 years at Rand, Helmer left it in 1968 
to join with Ted Gordon and Randites Paul Barron and Arnold Kramer in founding the Institute for the Future, a futurology think, think tank with Eastern Branch uh, located in Middletown, Connecticut, he headed for a time. The Institute in, encountered many difficulties in establishing a secure foothold and ultimately moved uh, to California uh, under uh, Roy Amara, where it continues to have a, uh, a uh, shaky existence. In 1973, Helmer left it to return to accept an appointment as the first and only Harold Quinton professor of future research in the newly established and short-lived Center for Future Research at the Business School in the University of Southern California. He retired from USC in 76, and for a year he functioned as a research scholar in the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis in Vienna. Then he retired to Carmel, California, and for some years continued to travel extensively with lecturing and consulting. And in 19, late 1970s, he published his one and only, well, there, there was published his one and only book, really written by a variety of collaborators, called Looking Forward, A Guide to Future Research. He continued to live uh, in uh, retirement for many years in Southern California and died there at the age of 101 in 2011. His heritage lives on here in Pittsburgh, where I have arranged uh, for a Helmer archive to form part of the uh, uh, Helmer Library's uh, archive for scientific philosophy in the 20th century. While Helmer, Helmer's main contribution was as a, as a futurist, his work in philosophy was also important. As a friend, colleague, and collaborator of Hempel's and Oppenheim's, he sought to shift the focus of theoretical interest, which then was mainly in explanation, from explanation to prediction. The shift from explanation and confirmation to prediction was uh, uh, indicative of his uh, larger interests. For his preoccupation with prediction uh, relates to his immersion in the atmosphere of Rand's military theorists and economists with forecasting issues. He soon came to believe that formalisms could not yield useful predictions and that uh, the idea of having a predictive calculus of some sort in line with uh, the various measures of explanation that were being devised uh, had to be abandoned and a uh, different turn from formalism to uh, human involvement had to be injected into the futuristic concern. Although he was a member of mathematics division at Rand Corporation, Helmer was rather more a humanist than a mathematician. In this regard, he was the most uh, senior of a small group of Rand mathematics division people, including Norman Dalkey, myself, and Frederick Thompson, all of whom had been trained in logic and philosophy of science. The composition of this group reflected the personal attitude of John Williams, the head of uh, mathematics division, and one of the founding fathers of Rand. And Helmer found this speculative atmosphere more congenial and made full use of his freedom uh, there to ride his uh, futuristic hobby horse. This brings us to the centerpiece of Helmer's contribution to futurological studies, the so-called Delphi method of ex ex expert prediction, which originated in a series of Rand studies in the 1950s. Like many other intellectual innovations of 20th century America, it was a child of the Cold War. Not until uh, after the 1966 publication of Helmer's Social Technology did the Delphi effectively penetrate beyond the Rand to uh, the form part of the futuristic enterprise at large. The basic idea of the Delphi technique is to proceed by means of structural interaction among a group of predictors. This predictive process proceeds without any face-to-face -face interaction among the group members. Instead, it uses a series of successive questionnaires to elicit responses from a panel of experts to arrive at an aggregate prediction for future developments. 
The experts are interrogated individually, usually by questionnaire, about their expectations for a series of hypothetical future events, typically one which could be given some numerical formulation. A typical study for a, ran, a typical uh, instance of a Delphi study might, for example, be the demographic question in what year, if ever, do you expect the at birth life expectancy of American females to reach 85 years? After a series of initial questionnaires is completed, the responses are assembled as statistical distributions and uh, then uh, supplemented by expert comments, by, by uh, comments from the relevant experts. And this is recirculated in the group, providing a second phase of judgment then. And the idea is that a number of iterations of this process will eventually lead to a convergence of some sort, and that this convergence hopefully will uh, be a better reflection of uh, what actually happens. Any number of studies of this sort were made and it was checked in what fields and with what respect to what issues these predictions could be relied on and where uh, there were going to be problems about them. But the idea is that this feedback aspect of the process makes for an, in, an impetus toward consensus that can be reinforced then by various artificial means, say by, uh, successively discarding extreme judgments and tightening the circuit of those that are retained for future processes. The Delphi method was received with eagerness in many circles and was now, uh, there was now a, a vast proliferation of Delphi exercises in various fields. The timing was propitious. The main body of his work was complete and ready for use when the futurology boom began in the 1960s. And these predictive studies came into being at a, at a, a time when uh, they fitted what the, uh, the zeitgeist of the moment uh, demanded. And it was this that propelled Heller Helmer into the first American professorship of futuristics. So, So in the short run, all went well, and it looks looked as though, uh, like the future, uh, futurism was here to stay. But over the long run, the situation was not so favorable. The futurism wave had been uh, that of this time was bound up ideologically with a vision of progress astir in the era of technological optimism that preceded the Vietnam era. And the bubble ultimately burst on this sentiment in the wake of a series of disasters, ranging from the Vietnam War itself to the collapse of America's failed hostage refuge uh, effort uh, in the desert of Iran, uh, the uh, disaster of the spaceship sound, uh, the industrial catastrophes of Bhopal in India, Sohito in Italy, and Chernobyl in the USSR in the USSR. And when it rains, it pours. There now came into prominence a long series of predictive failures, such as the misfiring of the Club of Rome's limits of growth prediction, the disastrous outcome of America's venture in Vietnam, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and other the collapse of the Soviet Union, and other really major events that uh, changed the uh, landscape of uh, uh, events uh, of world trading importance. In the US, of course, it was above all the collapse uh, of, the, of, Vietnam of the Vietnam effort that brought a drastic change in the ethos regarding uh, the capacity, our capacity to control events either predictively or productively. So in the wake of all this, it increasingly dawned on people that futurology was a dry well. However, the discipline's death certificate cannot limit itself to re the reading non-productivity as the cause of death. 
But this is not enough, of course, to cause demise. Many unproductive enterprises have a long lifespan. And here, there was also a need for the entry, zeitgeist incompatibility. Well, the intellectual spirit of the times underwent a severe change of wind direction in the post-Vietnam era. And so the enthusiasts of an intellectual boom lead, lived also to see it burst. The 1970s saw the beginning of an ebb tide for the pre, uh, preceding enchantment with the future. The technological optimism of the period took the view that just as astronauts were conquering the frontiers of space, so the futurologists were going to conquer the frontiers of time. But with the passage of years, the matter came to be viewed in a very different perspective. Post-Vietnam generation came to take a more dour and disillusioned view. And of course, a potent fact, potent factor here, important factor here was the disillusionment caused by the steady succession of predictive failures. Not least uh, the embarrassing inability of American economists accurately to forecast the response uh, of uh, the economy to various governmental initiatives. And future studies fell increasingly from favor as the course of events betokened that in increasing unappealing aspect of the future. It all happened so fast in the half-life of an individual I myself was in on the beginning of the work with Delphi in the early 1950s. My 1998 book on predicting the future could be seen as something of an obituary for the future bubble. To be sure, traces yet remain. As every death leaves its corpse, so every bubble leaves some residual aftermath. The Futurist magazine still publishes. The American forecaster is read by economists. Helmer's Institute for the Future still exists in vestigial form. The Delphi method that figures so prominently on the futurist agenda of the day, yet leaves some uh, aftermath in uh, the uh, in, uh, use of expert judgment more into the methodology of expert systems. But as regards futurology of the old style, this looks to be dead as a doornail. Its tombstone inscription is provided, well provided by Leo de Roche's trip. It, not trip, quip, <laughs> Leo de Roche's quip. It's, uh, it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> <laughs> it's ironic that those, I, that those dedicated futurologists were oblivious to the future of their own enterprise. <laughs> the entire episode conveys an instructive lesson. The tree of knowledge not only grows new branches, but loses old ones. And it does this not only with such massive projects as astrology or base metal to gold alchemy, but also with much smaller scale ventures such as futurology. In, the in 1965, it would have looked to be a certainty that futurology was an instructive discipline with a long and brilliant future before it. But in a little over two decades, it was gone with the wind. In suffering this fate, futurology provides an object lesson that vividly illustrates the problems and difficulties that confront this very enterprise itself. Thank you. Wonderful. So we'll take a one minute break and then we have plenty of time for, for, for questions. So if you have questions, please share them. Are questions for the audience? Synopsis of what they said for the, for the audience online. Yes, I'll try that. If it's not too much fun. No, no, it should, unless they make it difficult right. by, ram by rambling on. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 The mask is a teacher. It's.
Christmas flowers and birds. Yeah. All right, let's get uh, let's get going. Lisa, you're first. Great. So thank you for that lovely talk, uh, especially as a follow-on to your fall talk, which was also centered at and that. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, as someone who um, is so deeply engaged with the the sort of field that we've forgotten in many ways, whether or not you think it was a failure of technological optimism, a failure of particular technologies to work as expected, or it was the predictive failure, the sort of epistemic failing to see what might be coming. Because those seem like they could be different, like you could have technical failures um, that are sort of different than what people are predicting is going to happen. But the fall of Vietnam feels like an epistemic predictive failure than, rather than a technological failure. And I was wondering what you sort of saw as a, a driver or are they not separable? The, the question is, uh, if I understand it, uh, both what drove uh, the enthusiasm about uh, futurology and uh, what uh, uh, what shortcomings there were to the imp this impetus of uh, uh, launching this uh, this venture. What that, I mean, this is this is a, a, a uh, the first part of this is, 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 is a rigidly historical question, um, and it has to be answered on historical grounds. I think what motivated the interest in forecasting and seeing what happened is something that we see unfolding about us in the present in the present era, also very vividly, namely the need of. Uh, the military and the, uh, uh, the the diplomatic and military establishment for foresight into what other players on the scene are up to. Uh, we are now, uh, of course, gripped in this in a variety of ways. We we uh, would love to have insight into uh, what uh, a predictive insight into what Putin is going to be doing uh, in uh, Ukraine or what uh, uh, is happening uh, with our, our friend in, uh, uh, in North Korea about the missile program, right? The idea, uh, the, the great failure of the American military uh, intelligence establishment uh, to uh, foresee the uh, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor uh, was still in the, in the early 50s very much alive and of great concern to uh, those involved. And uh, so the idea of uh, using present indicators to forecast future behaviors, especially by international agents, uh, was uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, impetus, uh, modes of impetus for for futurology, and of course there are many obvious uh, many obvious uh, uh, other areas uh, uh, concerned. Uh, uh, the the uh, insurance industry's uh, interest in predicting uh, medical developments, uh, the uh, economists' uh, interest in predicting uh, economic development and market behavior. Uh, uh, the interest of, in the future is uh, 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 always there, and uh, there are very uh, important requisites for this kind of information uh, where available. And 
the, 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 the technological enthusiasm that uh, went with the great uh, technological innovations that uh, the Second World War had produced, uh, uh, both uh, in respect uh, to uh, armaments and, uh, and aircraft and so on, uh, led people to think and hope that uh, one could project into the future uh, some of those uh, scientific initiatives that had been developing in that, in that period. Uh, why didn't, why didn't uh, they realize more clearly what the nature of the difficulty that, they, that futurism confronted uh, uh, was going to be a real problem? And I think you can see that most clearly in the case of weather prediction. Of course, if you live in Southern California, you can predict six months in advance what the weather is going to be like when you have your garden party. But in many parts of the world, the situation is, is, is quite different and you're living in a less stable and therefore less predictive environment. Uh, what can we do to predict the weather? Well, we can, we can we, the, the weather three seconds hence is very easy to predict. It's the same that we've got now, right? But as you move into the future, it becomes murkier. Uh, when uh, uh, in the 1950s, uh, weather prediction by and large worked reasonably well, three or four days out, then gradually in the late, late uh, 20th century, it went down to seven days. Now it's somewhere wavering, hopefully with supercomputers and so on in the area of about 10 days. But the point, the point is, is clear that there are there are perturbations in the, in the, in the system that are uh, to some extent unforeseeable. There's chaos and randomness of one sort or another. Uh, that near-term prediction is uh, in many instances safe and possible, but that as you move out, the influence, influence of these unmanageable factors becomes more prominent and you can't do it. So of course, when you're launching a new enterprise, you're always, you're always, uh, you're looking at a half full glass. And you're always being enthusiastic, right? You always exaggerate hope on the positive side. And I think this was, uh, if if somebody had said, had had drilled home the lesson that I just gave, namely, it's fine for the near term when immediate trends are unlikely to be perturbed, but it's difficult in, in the medium term and impossible in the long term. Nobody wants to hear this common sense, right? This is, <laughs> this is an unwelcome and uninspiring lesson. Um, yeah, so uh, I think what, uh, what, 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 what made futurism go is the, uh, the half full glass, looking at those things where, where prediction was workable, might be workable, and hoping that this would work out over a much larger region. Yes. Um, would you be here? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Jason, and then I'll Jason. Jason, go for it. Okay. Yes. Um, so the Delphi method, I can't be in philosophy and not be interested in something called a method. Um, the name Delphi at first is ironic because of what you get from the Pythia is never really very clear. But I'm just <laughs> wondering what, how is it different than an antique? German tribal war council in just kind of like hashing it out until you get consensus. I mean, there is this statistical component, but I wonder if that's an epiphenomenon phenomenon of the process. It's just another way of representing everybody's views on a piece of paper. Is there something unique in the method? Is there at least a kernel, something we could walk away from? All of this money and research that went into this, was there some piece there that um, had value or is, is enduring? Or was it flawed from conception or Completely, uh, you know, not at all. Uh, let me say two things. One, uh, you're not in in any sort of method for any sort of any sort of purpose or goal. It's unlikely that one size fits all. It's unlikely that any given method will be more easily adaptable to some applications and less effectively applicable to others. So uh, if, you want to, you, if you want to make, 
if you want to make predictions, uh, the odds are that uh, you should investigate the phenomena that you're trying to predict in the context of the methods you've got available for doing it, and you'll find that some work better than others. And the idea was, of course, uh, to test out with respect to uh, Delphi uh, where or where it worked and where it didn't, um, and uh, how it could be improved, like uh, throwing away uh, uh, outliers. Uh, and uh, uh, Okay, that's, that's one point. The other point is something quite different. Look at the history of medicine. Why did, uh, why did uh, in the era of uh, kingdom throughout the history of Europe uh, in, in, in the 15th century, as well as in the 19th, uh, why did uh, rulers have court physicians? They didn't have court physicians because statistical indicators suggested that following the advice of court physicians worked better than following old wives' tales. Uh, it was the most, it was the most, Look at look at uh, look at medical training. Uh, what did physicians study in the in the universities of the of the seventeenth uh, century? Believe me, they studied a lot. They spent as much time in in, in learning in reading and learning and studying texts as they do today. But what did they read? They read Avicenna. They read the the ancient physicians. Uh, were they helpful? Well, for some things, yes, for others, no. But the point is, uh, those physicians trained as they were, were the best game in town. And when you need advice, when you need counsel, you go to the most hopeful of the available possibilities. Whether or not you have absolute or even, even reasonable assurance that that's a better way to go. Thank you for such an interesting talk. I was wondering whether you could perhaps explain in a bit more detail to, to those of us who have not grown up with futurology, um, what exactly it is that fell off the branch of knowledge. So we've still got some areas in which rather large scale predictions for rather considerable extents of time, drawing on rather interdisciplinary sources are being used to think of predictions about well, climate model, right? So if that kind of enterprise, if in a domain specific way is still happening, and is sometimes still being used to argue for or against certain broader visions of society, could you, could you pin down a bit what it is exactly that differentiates this sort of enterprise from the futurology that died in the late 1970s or so. So is it that certain ambitions were dropped or is it rather more just that a certain institutional framework collapsed or what, what is it exactly that we lost there? There, there um, all right. There is in theory, in theory, a perfectly rational way of construing the future logical prospect, which would make sense even to today. Namely, you can, you can, you, there are many, many fields in which uh, prediction is uh, constantly employed, right? Medicine, perhaps preeminently among them, but economics also. Uh, one could easily, and to some extent people do, launch into studies of how uh, effective the methods being used to forecast the progress of diseases and so on are. As you, can, you, can, you can make a, a perfectly sensible project by investigating for specific modes of forecasting 
what uh, kinds of uh, proceedings work better than others. That is possible. Uh, but this was not this was not the ambition of the futurologists of the day, right? They they thought that there was a kind of meta enterprise. A a uh, look. Let me take another example in philosophy of science. Uh, uh, explanation, right? Scientific explanation, uh, scientific validation, scientific confirmation. These were all tremendously big enterprises. In the, among philosophers of science in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, right? Uh, the idea was that there was, could be developed not how we explain, you know, why certain things happen in a particular region of the economy or in a particular area of medical phenomena, but a larger scale meta method that could be used as a template or paradigm for prediction across or explanation or uh, confirmation across a whole range. And this idea of looking for something general that uh, was also an important part of the ethos of the day. And it was something to which the uh, scientific explanation and confirmation people were just as much liable, were just as liable as the scientific prediction people. So, uh, now, the interesting thing is what has happened ethos wise in philosophy of science with regard to uh, explanation. If you read uh, Wesley Salmon's book, 40 Years of Explanation, uh, you see what in the 1930 uh, to 1970 era, uh, people were, were doing with, with explanation and they were they were doing the, this, this attempt to have a general, develop a general theory. Uh, the idea of a, a, a splintering across the landscape of little special concerns for explanation of this or that kind, uh, I mean, that's a useful cottage industry, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna result in a, a, a scientific movement. Now, the trouble is what happens to that scientific movement when its, when its gas runs out, which it did for futurology and which it really did for explanation and confirmation. Right? When I was growing up, uh, explanation and confirmation papers littered the literature. Now you look for them in vain. Um, that's what I refer to as the, the, the zeitgeist, the ethos of a time in terms of expectations and projects changes. And what changes it is partly the failures of the enterprise. But I suggest they're often not enough. There are also attitudinal changes that come about through emphasis that bring other modes of act, uh, activity. So uh, what, ha what, what, what is surprising about the philosophy of science of the day, right, is that you can often not tell the difference between a scientific paper and a philosophy of science paper. The, the methods, the arguments, the techniques, the, the points invoked are so much the same on either side that the line between them tends to tends to vanish and the, the concept of a meta science rather than a science of actual practice where you look at what people are doing in this or that sort of specific domain that's that's a, a change in expectation and attitude okay um i think we may have already have addressed part of my question but um, in terms of this kind of the, the overarching goal of futurology to have kind of um, predictive power mm -hmm. um, and that the kind of, uh, you know, that it wasn't all that fruitful, it didn't work out. And I'm wondering if, if you might, or whether or not you see it as kind of a failure of the, the mechanistic worldview, you know, the whole, of, the whole assumption that given an input you have a unique output and you know how much of a role do you feel that played in this I don't yeah I there is there is something uh, there is something in uh, 
uh, in what you what you uh, what you say. Um, I don't know exactly how we're going to characterize the mechanistic worldview. Uh, it's a matter. It's a matter of uh, how you conceive of the process of understanding phenomena, understanding things that you're interested in. Right? An essential aspect of our endeavor to understand things is the subsumptive effort to include what it is we're trying to understand within some broader category where we also have general principles and we could say, ah, but given that that's how things work in the broader category, it's only normal, natural, and to be expected that within this more limited range of concern to us, things should develop in this or that particular way. So the subsumptive, the subsumptive effort to try to uh, subsume, try to include objects of uh, investigation within broader ranges of occurrence and phenomena. That's not part of a mechanism. That's part of the, our fundamental understanding of rationality. That's how, how, things, how things work when we're saying, ah, oh, we understand how this or that kind of thing goes. Now, what is uh, uh, altogether too tempting is to put the cart before the horse, to hasten this, this conclusion, to expect uh, that uh, you should be able to have a kind of top-down uh, approach where you start on generalities which are given to you by God knows what, and then you account for specifics in terms of them, as opposed to making a careful study of a variety of specifics and seeing to what extent they share and have a kind of element of commonality. Uh, so it's this top-down, bottom-up thing that is different. Now, in I, that's, that's, I wouldn't call that mechanism necessarily. It's, it's, a, it's a characteristic way of thinking about things, uh, which works in mechanics as it works everywhere else. Uh, but there is, there is that tendency to overgeneralize principles. You're always, you're, you're always safest. Uh, you're always safest uh, when you uh, uh, limit yourself to a more specific or more vaguely characterized sort of region. And when you try for generality and precision, beyond the limits of warrant, you're going to run into trouble. But establishing those limits of warrant a priori, that is before you try it and see what happens and see if you can get away with it, that's uh, the problem. Lubadan. So Lubadan will join us from Zoom. Okay, uh, thank you, Edward. Thank you, uh, Nick, for... Uh very informative lecture and hello everybody i know i only see nick and edward there uh so <clears throat> one I, I sort of was very skeptical of futurology i thought it was ridiculous until i started reading more uh what these people were uh, actually trying to accomplish so isn't it sort of regular kind of an event when you have an emerging field especially in social sciences uh, that some of the branches will sort of die out, that uh, they were too ambitious and so on, and that maybe uh, there's a sort of a, it's kind of a motivation to rethink uh, the project. One of uh, the projects of a very different sort, I think, was Stanislav Lem's uh, Summa Technologia, which wasn't really translated until, I think, 2000 and maybe 13, so maybe 50 years after he wrote it, very detailed general sort of outline of a domain of uh, technology that we, he thought will emerge in the next 50 or 100 years. And pretty much everything actually happened the way he, he said. But if we try to do sort of a positive thing and try to think about futurology as something that can be useful and predictive, predictive uh, within 
one way to think about it is to determine the horizon in which we try to operate. And then if you think about 20 years or 30 years, uh, the uh, horizon, the usual argument against futurology is, well, you know, there are all these uh, uh, disruptive technologies and we can never really get it right. It's all nonlinear. Who knows what's going to be discovered and so on. And that's true, actually. There are disrupt disruptive technologies. But on the other hand, we also know how economies actually operate. Cutting-edge developed economies take time, and I will finish in a second, take time to absorb these disruptive technologies. And we know actually how long it takes them. Uh, they can never really grow uh, above, I think, 2.5% per year. We know that. So it's really actually possible to make detailed predictions with respect to how a technological advance of society, at least developed societies, uh, within next like 20 or 30 years. So maybe that's where, you know, you can even model and, you know, do much more of a sort of predictive work if you're a futurologist. I mean, is that something that one could do, do you think, instead of these sort of naive attempts that you describe? The, sh the short answer is yes. That never, that never in philosophy does much help. <laughs> uh, you, you know, you get, you, 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 get, you get the call box, you can call the recording angel, you can ask the recording angel any question you like, you're gonna get the correct answer, and it, but unfortunately it's gonna be a yes or no question. So, you know, you ask, uh, uh, is there a deity or is there free will? And the answer comes back, yes or no. What, what, what do you know? What do you have? What, what, what good does that do you? Um, not much. The, uh, what, what, you, what, you, what you say is, I think, basically right. And it led to a transformation within the futurological movement because uh, uh, one of the things that uh, people when, when, they, when they first began to realize how difficult the predictive venture was going to be, is to say, let's not try to predict what the future will be. Let's try to predict, let's try to lay out alternative possible futures. Let us not have futures, but futurible, uh, possible courses of development in the future that we can, well, that we can map out now <laughs> and uh, uh, then uh, at least uh, have, a, have a better grasp on what the, the things are that are going on. The trouble, of course, is that that enterprise itself is, is, uh, is, is immensely <clears throat> problematic. That is to say, uh, you, think, you think you can lay out uh, these five uh, courses of future development, but there's a sixth one over here, and that's the one that gets realized. Uh, there's no way of, there's no way of uh, having assurance there. Now, I, I do, point one. Point two is I do think that, 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 that the, the study of, of, of prediction in various special domains under particular circumstances and conditions is potentially, is potentially fruitful and sometimes necessary. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you can't begin, if, if it were hopeless to try to predict how a, uh, an epidemic or pandemic is going to evolve. You cannot, you cannot formulate policy without some sort of predictive input. And so this is what I'm saying, just as the, the 17th century patient had no, diff, no alternative but to seek the best available advice and heed it, even though that advice might be crummy and even though he realizes that advice might be crummy. So the best available policymaker of the present moment has no alternative but to go into the relevant community of experts and to get some idea of what uh, the, the, the prospects of. Uh, so this is, this is not, it's not, it's not that we resort to a certain method because we have positive evidence that it's going to work. It's that we resort to it because we have no alternative. It's a faute de mieux resolution of the problem and not a here we have an assured uh, way of going forward sort of solution.
Thanks. Thanks for good advocacy again. Great. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you very much for the talk. I was it was good to see you end with a great baseball wisdom of Leo de Rocher. <laughs> I would add another baseball wisdom about the future, the great American baseball person and philosopher Yogi Berra, who was once asked about an up-and-coming prospect who had just got promoted to the major leagues. And he said, Berra said, his future is ahead of him. <laughs> Very good, good observation. Uh, good. A more serious question, I guess, involves sort of a continuation of some of the other matters that have been discussed. And that is, I guess, by what metric or, or when do you give up? When, when, what are the time lengths of scale or absurdly numerical predictions at which you give up on a on a certain, uh, when these are futurology or domains thereof become sort of extinct, they die off on their own or they're sort of just pushed off to the side uh, explicitly. 1950s had a lot of cultural reference. 1950s had a lot of techno optimism, nuclear yes. power too cheap to meter, et cetera. Right. 1957, 58, 18 month period called the International Geophysical Year where we're going to do all these things and launch satellites and many of it, much of this happened. There was a, um, uh, if you're familiar with Steely Dan, one of the members did a solo record in the early 1980s, 25 years after 1957, called IGY, International Geophysical Year. Yeah. And when you listen to the lyrics, you can hear these comical predictions that were made that he heard when he was a tween age kid, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, about how the future is going to be. And the, the song is a joke about those things. And it's an obscure song that if you want to listen to it. And so within a lifetime, 25 years, he knew that these things that were told, he was told were going to happen, did not happen. And certainly these mid-1960s, mid-1970s forecasts by the early 80s or whatever certainly weren't panning out, at least in some fields, but in other fields they were. So one, I guess my question becomes, what are the metrics? And I'm thinking, does it measure itself against itself? I'm thinking in the physical sciences, uh, my understanding is that cert certain searches for dark matter candidate, particle candidates, aren't getting anywhere, but they're not really getting anywhere against another alternative as they would in medicine, this bacterium, this bacterium. They're just not getting anywhere as vis-a-vis -vis themselves. And um, I just, you know, weather predictions for weather, as late as World War II, I think the most accurate weather prediction was the weather tomorrow will be the same as it is today. At the end of the war, that was different. But so what are you measuring this against in terms of time frames, in terms of other things? In certain social sciences, there were reasonably accurate predictions in the late 70s about the oncoming collapse in the next several decades of the East Bloc, its unsustainability. Certain Western democracies had long-term reliable predictions about changes, long-term changes in political behavior, voting behavior. Measured against, and those worked. And these other ones didn't. So how does futurology measure itself? Or is it just a common person in the streets? These things just didn't pan out. Let's just not continue along those lines. OK. Uh, well, the, the way, of course, the natural way in which you measure the merit of a prediction is whether or not it comes out, right? Whether or not things eventuate that way. The difficulty, of course, is, and it's interesting, if you look at some of the specific uh, studies that uh, Olaf Helmer did, and uh, we did at Rand, you have a, uh, you have a, a I forget what the, what the, they're all available on, uh, free of charge on, on Rand's website. Um, you have a, a series of uh, uh, Delphi type predictions of development in different fields. Some have, are remarkably accurate and remarkably on target. Uh, uh, predictions, uh, one of the ones that comes to my mind is uh, uh, the interaction of uh, mechanical devices uh, and, uh, and the human body and the control of uh, uh, limbs, artificial limbs by thought processes and so on. Uh, they, were, they were predicted and they were predicted quite accurately and they were, came across more or less on time. The difficulty is when you have a bunch of predictions, some of which come true and some of which don't, you have no way of knowing at the time which is going to be which, right? That's the, that's the whole, if you knew at the time which was going to be which 
and that some of them weren't going to be realized, you wouldn't make them. You don't know, it's like it's like drilling for oil. You don't know which wells are going to strike and which wells aren't at the time. Once you've done it, then, then you've done it. Now, uh, how far do you how far do you go? How far you how long do you stay with it? When do you, you say this 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 way of proceeding is a lost cause or not? That governs human relations uh, from start to finish, right? That it's not limited to this domain. And the, 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 the general principles are very easy. It depends on the, the need you have for getting a resolution, the patience you have in waiting for one, and uh, uh, the, uh, the means of affordability. That is to say, when the National Science Foundation stops backing your project, <laughs> the time has come to stop it. Uh, yeah, so uh, this, this, that's, another, that's a very difficult, that's a very difficult issue. And uh, of course, you, you could put yourself in the, in the position there, you know, of, of, of funders for, for projects. How do they, how do they decide what, what's, a, what's a, a good bet and what's a, a lost cause? Well, uh, they do the best they can, or, or uh, alas, as I know from bitter experience with those hundred books, publishers. Right? How, do, how does the publisher decide whether he's going to sell the thing or whether it's going to fizzle after, after 50 copies? Uh, and uh, they, they do what they can, and if they had a method for doing better, they'd use it. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you for this wonderful talk. I really did not want to say anything because I know in the future we're not talking about predictions and methods, but the online question uh, uh, mentioned Stanislaw Plan, so I feel it's kind of duty as a, as a visitor from Poland <laughs> to say something because this is really a remarkable book, the one that, that, that uh, the online person mentioned, namely Summa Technologi. And now there is a kind of irony in the title because this is, of course, a reference to Summa Theology by Thomas Aquinas. So he was, I mean, Stanislaw Lem was self-aware in the sense that there is a flavor of scholasticism in futurology, let's say. And so he was, uh, by no means, he he had anything to do with, with Thomas Aquinas. So. This was a kind of irony and, and, and the game played with the reader. But there is a take, let's say, for us also, I guess, that if there is this flavor of scholasticism and futurology, the problem is not that we tend to, to that we want to elicit some general uh, patterns in evolution, including technological evolution, but the problem is that futurology was supposed to be part of science, not just speculation. So I wonder what you think about the prospects, if there are any, of futurology as a philosophical project, not scientific. Project. I think there are, I think a, a, a general treatise on epistemology would be deficient and flawed if it didn't raise the question, what's, what sort of phenomena are predictable with, 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 with precision, right? I mean, if you, if you, mess muck, if you muck up your predictions uh, in, in uh, in layers of uh, clouded generality and, and, and ambiguity, but then you're in the question that people argue about whether Mast Nostradamus successfully predicted this or that, right? If, if the, the beauty of the predictions that, uh, that were made by the Delphi method is that they were at least precise, and therefore you could tell whether or not they came, of, they came across or not. Uh, that's critical. So, this, this, this study of general conditions under which prediction works and doesn't work, what, what you have to assume about the nature of the system and its functioning before you can hope to uh, predict what it's doing. If you, if you have some control over external influences or uh, so the, the, the issue under which 
of conditions under which this predictive enterprise works and doesn't work, those are perfectly legitimate epistemological questions. And I think, I think it makes it, it makes sense. And it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't issue from the problematic presumption that uh, there's going to be a general discipline of forecasting, which will enable us to handle uh, anything that comes along. Yeah, I, that one just made me change my question, but I'll deal with it anyway. Is it possible that that the image that this all points to the scientific generality, scientific prediction, scientific laws actually doesn't exist? So force equals mass times acceleration never applies because the conditions under which it must apply never exist. Is it possible that there's an illusion of what scientific law is and does with respect to generality and specificity? And that's why we constantly keep striving after creating philosophical or economic or whatever systems that, that will match this thing that, that, that isn't really there. Look, there is the, the 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 difficulty the difficulty with science lies in the aspirations of the enterprise and how you construe them right if you construe the aspirations of the enterprise in uh, classical terms that is you want you want a a a set of laws that enables you to predict how things comport themselves in nature everywhere and always right then uh, you're going to be uh, subject to uh, complaint. And the obvious complaint is that we live in an evolutionary universe, a universe that has a history and that has different laws and principles in operation uh, at different points of time. You didn't need laws of microeconomics uh, in the first uh, nanosecond of the universe's history under the, uh, under the uh, uh, usual uh, expansive explosive model, uh, the Big Bang model, right? Uh, disciplines develop, the need for, the need for biology comes uh, uh, much later in the game uh, than the need for thermodynamics. Uh, uh, so you have a system whose laws develop and change and for all you know, uh, those principles which are general to what is happening as it were now, are gonna have to be modified in some way in the course of cosmic evolution to what happens uh, a good deal further down the road. So, uh, yeah, so uh, whether or not, uh, you know, you suggest maybe maybe the whole aspiration of being able to explain and understand natural phenomena is, uh, is vain. The answer is, it depends. Uh, if it's, uh, it depends on what you're asking for. If you're asking for principles that hold always and everywhere, you're in, you're in, 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 in a problem area. If you're asking, for, if you can say, well, if the conditions under which things are happening now persist, then these and these things will happen. But if you conditionalize it, you're on much safer ground. Speaking of safer ground, I'm thrown out of scene. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Everybody, thank God it's for a very thank long time. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your patience. It's all good to you, man. Thanks, Nick, for coming out. And uh, you haven't put your name at the entrance, please put your name for contact tracing. That's the us. Uh, and uh, otherwise, we'll see you uh, next week so, or on Friday for the workshop on the Thanks for your opportunity. Thank you very much. Ah, you're going to want that back. Yes, of course. We, we, we might. We might. <laughs> exactly. All right.